So good, man, so good. Hey, welcome again, all our locations, uh, back to Winter Park location, uh, Winter Springs, Sanford, and Oviedo, if you're worshiping with us online. Uh, hey, super, super excited and honored to be with you. Hey, so there's some connection that has just taken place, obviously us connecting with God, connecting to each other. We're going to dive more into that, but, but let's do a little crowd participation right now. So I need you to participate with me, all locations. I'm going to give you a few statements. So turn to the person that you greeted most recently and repeat after me, say, hey, person, Say, hey person, it's me again. I'm glad you're at church. And I want you to know that you are blessed to be sitting beside me. <laughs> this guy's like, it's true, because I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Hey, speaking of awesome, speaking of tripping, my name is John, and I serve as the family pastor here at Action Church. And, and what that means, a couple of roles that I get to, get to serve in here, I get to serve and support my family and I. My wife and I get to serve and support our premarital process, which we're super excited about. And then we get to serve and support with Action Kids. I see all those shirts. I see all those shirts in the room. And then, obviously, we got, uh, we got Next Gen, our middle school and high school. Awesome. Which we'll talk a little bit about momentum. You guys hype for momentum. We'll talk a little bit more momentum, uh, a little bit more about momentum here in a little bit, and then uh, obviously supporting also some college ministry stuff. But but for what we're going to do here today, um, I just want you to set that aside. Uh, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for two decades, but I want you to set that aside. And hypothetically, hypothetically, you and I know each other, even though we don't necessarily know each other, but. You and I know each other. We spend some time together. We, we live in the same neighborhood or, or we live in the same dorm room or, or we ride the bus together to school or we're in third period AP biology or, or our kids play little league together or, or we play 10th grade soccer together or just, just wherever it is. We work full time or we work part time. Just wherever it is, male and female, we just happen to know each other. And I've been watching your life, hypothetically, even though I'm a pastor and that's why I'm standing before you, but hypothetically, I just, the, the question that I have, I'm watching your life as a man of faith, as a woman of faith, and the question that I have, I don't know anything about faith other than I've been, what I've seen in and through you, and my question for you is, what do I need to do to be good at Christianity? Now, it's, a, it's an interesting question framed in an interesting way. What do I need to do to be good at Christianity? And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, that's, well, that's weird. First of all, that's weird. Well, well, I mean, if you think about it, you try to, I'm sure, you endeavor to be good at everything that you do. You're trying to be good at work. You're trying to be good at extracurriculars. You're trying to be good at play. You're trying to be good uh, as a spouse. You're trying to be good as a parent. You're trying to be good. So I don't know anything about faith other than what I've observed of your life. And even as I say that, some of you are sitting there going, Ah, what, what would my life demonstrate to someone who's watching? Well, we need to understand people are always watching. So I'm watching your life and I'm intrigued because my life is just going sideways fast. And so we're sitting down together, you and I, we're sitting down together. We're at, uh, we're at Taco Bell, we're at Taco Bell and we're having a number seven, a uh, chicken quesadilla uh, with, with a soft taco, no lettuce, no cheese, one pack of fire and three Mountain Dew refills, hypothetically, but <laughs> getting my belly, that sounds so good right now, but focus, focus, this is important. So we're sitting at Taco Bell, we're having a conversation and I just ask you, what do I need to do to be good at Christianity? Now, probably, probably you would give a, a few of these answers. You would say, well, well, John, here's what you need to do. You need to, you, need to, you need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. And absolutely, this is the source of truth. You need to read the Bible. You need to find a good church. You need to find a good church. Are, are you thankful at all of our locations? Are you thankful for what God is doing in and through Action Church? Uh, having been a part of pastoral ministry for, like I said, two decades, I I'll say to you that what God is doing in and through Action Church is not unprecedented, but it's right up there. Like, it's truly, truly special. It's truly unique. And so, so find, you need to find a good church. You, you, need, to, you need to serve. you got to serve. You need to be willing to give your life away. you got to place your faith in Christ if you want to be a good Christian. you got, you got, to, you got to ask Jesus into your life. I mean, obviously, that's a foundational piece. you got to pray. You gotta, you gotta pray just to make it today. Hey, hey, and you gotta serve. I mean, like, these are the things that you, and, and if I were to ask you, what do I need to do to be good at Christianity? These were the things that you would probably list. And you're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty complete list. And here's what's interesting. All of those things are an, a, a, an element of the answer. But when Jesus was asked, in Matthew 22, Jesus was asked this question. 
He was asked this question, what do I need to do to be good at this movement that you're initiating? And I've literally stood on platforms from, from Miami to Alaska and talked about and taught about the importance of, of, of being connected to God's word and God's heart, the, the, the forgiveness of sins and placing your faith in Christ to, to, to serve and to give and to, to be a part of a Bible-believing church. I've literally uh, taught across the country about the significance of those things, but when Jesus was asked, What's the most important thing? That's not what his answer was. Let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look. We're going to open up. We'll have this for you on the screen. This is Matthew 22. And Jesus is hanging out with a spiritual poser. Say poser. A poser. Student culture, they would know. You're probably familiar. A poser is someone who externally... They look like they've got it all together, but internally they really have no idea what they're talking about. And, and, and in Matthew 22, Jesus is hanging out with a spiritual poser. Uh, picking up in verse 34, it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. The, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were the religious and political leaders of the day. And Jesus had just in, had an, inter, an, an encounter with the Sadducees. And here's what's interesting. They were religious and political leaders of the day. But the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. And that's why they were sad. Did you see? <laughs> You saw where I was going. So, so that's why they were sad, you see. And so Jesus is hanging out with this spiritual poser, this Pharisee. Now listen to this. It says, one of them, an expert in the law, a very important word. We'll talk about that. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. One of them, an expert in the law, a very important word. Not an expert in grace, not an expert in hope, not an expert in compassion, not an expert in forgiveness, not an expert in redemption, one of them an expert in the law. And if there's anything, unfortunately, that I would say characterizes people of faith in 2019 in America is that people tend to know what we're opposed to rather than what we're in support of. And in this particular instance, this guy is taking great pride in his knowledge of the law. One of them an expert in the law. And here's what you need to understand. Not like, the, like the knowledge, that pride, it, it's going to puff up. Pride, guys and ladies, pride is the language of division, but humility is the language of connection. And in this particular instance, this guy, this expert, he doesn't even really want to know the answer to the question. He's just trying to paint Jesus into a corner. But we're having this conversation. What do I need to do? I'm watching your life. What do I need to do to be good at Christianity. There's people in the room that have probably been going to church for four decades. There's probably people in the room that are certainly first time guests here today at all of our locations. You're worshiping with us online. Anywhere and everywhere that you're at on this spectrum, I just want you to think about what would it look like to be good at Christianity? And so uh, listen to this. This is the question. Teacher, rabbi, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied in, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, Jesus replied, Lord, the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You've probably heard this verse. Even if you've only been to church maybe a handful of times in your life, you've probably heard this verse. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Like everything. Jesus says everything hangs on these two elements right here. Love God with everything I've got. Love my neighbor like I love me. Go ahead and put that, put that up on the screen right now. Say this with me. Love God with everything I've got. Love my neighbor like I love me. If I were to ask you, if we're sitting there having a conversation anywhere and I ask you, what do I need to do to be good at Christianity? You would come up with this list. You would come up with this list of things, a healthy and important and, and, and really correct list of things. You need to go to church. You need to give. You need to serve. You need to be involved in a small group. You need to, to forget the past and you need to, to press on to like all of those things. Yes, the answer is to all of those things is yes. And yet, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing? He said, love God with everything I've got. And love my neighbor like I love me. Everything pours out of that, right? So let me ask you this. If we were to, like we're having this conversation, if I were to ask you what would be more difficult, to love God or to love our neighbors? So we'll start with this. How many of you, uh, raise your hand if you love yourselves. Raise your hand if you love yourselves. Raise your... Okay, okay. A couple of people were like. <laughs> A couple of people were like. Me and myself aren't really. We're not really talking to each other right now. It's, it's weird. It's complicated. I'm not really feeling me right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like here's the thing I would say to you. There's a couple reasons why we, we sometimes struggle to love our neighbors as, our, as ourselves. Maybe because we don't necessarily love ourselves. 
Like, how can I love the people around me if I'm not convinced that God has a significant plan? Like, if I'm not convinced that I'm more than a conqueror, like, if I'm not convinced that God has set me apart for something greater, like, like if I'm not convinced that, that, that God has fearfully and wonderfully fashioned me for a purpose, if I'm not convinced of that, then how can I love the people around me? That's a challenge that we have. And some of you are sitting there going, hey, Pastor, you don't, like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've thought. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I've thought. But what's amazing about that is it doesn't matter what I've done because God's grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter what I've said because God's grace is sufficient. It doesn't matter what I've thought because God's grace is sufficient. And if you're not necessarily clapping right now, perhaps you haven't been the beneficiary of grace as yet. I would say to you, I would say to you that, that honestly, it's easy to love God in 2019. Like, like even in the culture that we live in, it's easy to love God in 2019. Now, some people would say, man, like, like you really? Like, you're really going to believe in this, 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 this fairy tale, this myth? No, 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 no. It's not even like that. In fact, let's, let's take a look. The, the amazingness of God's creation speaks to his very existence. Take a look at this. This is uh, Romans 1.20. It says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I'm going to tell you, in 2019, in all of our locations, I want to say, like, God speaks for himself. Like, his creation speaks for himself. Like, we, we, took, a, we took a day as our family. We went over to the beach this week, and, like, like, you're standing there, the power, the wind, the waves, the ocean. You go up to the mountains, the sun, the moon, the stars. Like, the eagle flies over. Like, like God's creation is so magnificent. It leaves us without an excuse as to his very existence. And here's what's amazing. You go out and you see a full moon, and you're like, man, God, you are awesome. But you know what? The full moon pales in comparison to the person sitting beside you right now because, because you are the one that was fashioned in God's image. Not the moon. Like, 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 like God wants you to see the people around you like that with that kind of value and that kind of heart and that kind of hope. And it will change everything. Like, it'll change everything. I want to tell you, I think it's easy to love God with everything I've got. I think the challenge is to love our neighbors like we love ourselves because some of us don't feel worthy of love ourselves. Or, or hey, hey, pastor, you don't, know, like, you don't know what my neighbor's done to me. Well, what have you done to your neighbor? And aren't you thankful that God's grace was sufficient for you to cover that? So check this out right here. Let's, uh, let's take, a little, uh, take a little quiz. Take a little quiz. Take a, little, yeah, a couple people like, Okay, um, I'll go with you on that. A few people are like, wait, do you guys, you, guys, you guys take quizzes at your church? Is that what we, no, 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 relax, relax, relax. So, so the entirety, Jesus said, uh, all the law and the prophets hang on these two elements. And so everything that you've read, everything that you've heard, everything that you've seen, it all, it, it, this is Jesus, this is God's love letter to us. But there's a, there's a specific chapter in Scripture there's a specific chapter in Scripture affectionately referred to as the love chapter. And I would say to you that it is it's God's Twitter, like bullet points, definition of love, right? And so you've ever been to, a, has anybody ever been to a wedding or you've been in a wedding or you're familiar with the concept of being wedded? And so in my, in my illustrious uh, wedding performing career, I performed 45 weddings to date. And, and I always share 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8a. You've probably heard it. love is patient, love is kind does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking. You've probably heard that. And it's not necessarily, it's, that's not even a conversation about romantic love. That's about the concept of love. Love God with everything I've got. Love my neighbor like I love me. And so here's what I want to do. We're going we're gonna to have a little quiz. If, 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 if God says, if Jesus says the most important thing that you can do is love the people around you, then let's see how we're doing with the concept of love. So we're gonna put 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight A, up on the board. Love is patient, love is kind, you can see. My name is John, um, and, and your name is Catherine, or your name is Anthony. Like every time I say my, every time I say the word love, I just want you to take, take the word love, pull it out and put your name in there. So, so love is patient, so John is patient, Catherine is patient, Anthony is patient, you know, Shanae is kind, like, what, well, like whatever it is right there. And so every time I say the word love, I just want you to take the word love out and I want you to put your name in there, okay? So let's do this. At all of our locations, humor me with this. We're gonna take this quiz. I want you guys to close your eyes. I'll read it for you. And let's just see how we're doing on God's definition of love. Every time I say the word love, just put your name in there. Just put your name in there in your mind. Love is patient. I'm just gonna just walk through this together. Love is patient. You got your eyes closed. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. 
Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. Love rejoices with truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. Okay, look at me. Look at me. I studied nonverbal, <laughs> even, even in a group like this, I studied nonverbal communication at UCF, and this is the vibe that I'm picking up right now. Some of you guys are sitting there going, oh, as it turns out, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> you were right, babe. You've been telling me for years. You're right. I'm, I'm bad at life. And so, yeah, yeah, like, like love is patient, love is kind. Some of you guys are like, like, bro, I didn't even get through the first sentence. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, like, that's too real, that's too real. But, but if, if Jesus said, love God with everything you got, love your neighbor like you love yourself, it, it meant like, this is what it's supposed to look like. Like, my life, this is what it's supposed to look like. And here's the deal, like, we serve at UCF, we serve at UCF, and, and in the context of what we do, 68,000 students at a state-supported university, and people all the time are like, Pastor John, how can, like, how can you and your family, like, minister at UCF, a big state-supported university? Like, don't people push back you, uh, on that? And I'm like, hey, no, 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 Even at UCF, or you fill in the blanks, whatever school you go to, wherever you work, Fill in the blanks. Like, it, people don't push back against the reality of Christ. What people push back against is that someone who claims faith but doesn't live a different life, uh, th- th- like, 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 you're, like you claim faith but you, you're struggling just like me? You claim faith but you're stressed and awake at, at night just like me? Like, like, what's your faith doing for you? Like, people don't question the reality of Christ. They question a life that doesn't look any different than theirs. And if you want to be a difference maker, you have to live a different life. It's not your reputation that's at stake. It's Jesus' reputation at stake, and, and, and he's trustworthy. He's all-time undefeated. Like, here's the deal. Like, like, so, okay, so let's do this. We, we, I mean, we just, we just kind of walked through here, and we looked at God's definition of love. And there's a couple of statements that have always jumped out at me, a couple of statements from, you know, love is patient, love is, There's one that has always jumped out at me, two in particular, that we'll talk about. Uh, one of them is, is love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, now you, you, you're not going to walk around using that language. You're not going to sit at the stoplight and say, you know, excuse me, I, 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 shan't, I shan't keep a record of wrongs against thee, although perhaps the Lord shall smite you. Like, unless you're just a freak, you wouldn't do that. But what's a modern day way that we would translate keeping a record of wrongs? What, what would we say? What would we say? That's right, that's right. We, holding grudges, holding grudges. You, keeping a, love, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not hold grudges. You want to know, who, let's have some fun with it. You want to know who, who sometimes struggles with holding grudges? You want to know who sometimes struggles with holding grudges? Ladies. Be real, man. Said be real. Hey, hey, listen, again, from my perspective, he's like, this is too real. It just got real. It was already a little warm in here, you know what I'm saying? And so here, listen, listen, listen. Now, from my perspective in this room, and it's probably true of all of our locations as well, as soon as I said that ladies can struggle with holding grudges, like half the ladies in the room are like, oh, no, he didn't. I was kind of feeling the, you know, the bald guy until this point. Oh, no, he did. I can't even. And so you're going to hold a grudge against me for suggesting that you're bad about holding grudges. So thank you, ladies, for proving your point, right, right, right? So that's half the ladies in all the room. That's half the ladies. And the other half of the ladies are sitting there going, it's true. <laughs> it's true. We are, we are so bad. We are so bad, especially her right over there. <laughs> Three rows over, two seats back. Yeah, just pray for her, Pastor. I don't know if she even knows the Lord. She's so, <laughs> no, I'll hit you up later. It'll be, she, she's, yeah, her heart is bad. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, so <laughs> thanks for humoring me. Okay, so, so I, I, so I hypothetical, I'll paint a picture. So you got two ladies. Ladies can sometimes struggle with holding grudges. You got two ladies um, uh, having lunch together. We'll pick it up. We'll, we'll raise the standard a little bit from, uh, from, from, you know, from, from Taco Bell. Let's go to Olive Garden. We got two ladies. Uh, now, you turn to somebody right now and say, praise God for them breadsticks, man. <laughs> Like, you ever sat down and the server comes up and you're like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a basket of breadsticks and some Alfredo and a Coke. And then they come back and they're like, what would you like to order? And you're like, no, I got it right here. Like, this is all I need. But no, 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 that's, that's dudes. But the ladies, you got two ladies sitting there and they're having lunch. And ladies can sometimes struggle with holding a grudge. And so you got two ladies sitting there. Sanford's going to love this story right here. you got two ladies sitting there at Olive Garden. And ladies can sometimes struggle with holding grudges. And it goes a little something like this, hypothetically, but it goes something like this. One girl goes to the other girl. She's like, um, 
you see, you see that girl over there? When I was, when I was nine, right? Um, my, parents, my parents threw me a birthday party, and it was a Care Bears birthday party because they're so cute and cuddly, and it's cool. But um, she came to my party because we're friends and everything, but here's the deal. <laughs> She came to my party and she was wearing the exact same. This did you hear the lady? She's like, oh no. She's like, I know where this is going. She's she, focus, this is important. Get back, get back, yes, focus. So she, she came to my party and she was wearing the exact same Care Bears t-shirt that I was wearing. And all the girls said to her, your shirt's so pretty, but they didn't tell me my shirt was pretty. Oh, and I'm on a nerd party with my baby. And this lady's like 51 years old now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Ladies, turn to somebody right now and say, let it go, let it go. Yeah, I mean, just, hey, don't let, hey, don't let that hold you back anymore. Like, like, some of the ladies, like, it's, you know, certain things are just unforgivable. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Quasi-funny guy. And so, hey, you know who's pretty good? You know who's pretty good about not holding grudges? Dudes. Yeah, it's because we just, we have no idea what we're supposed to be doing. Like, we're, yeah, we're clueless. Guys are like, wait, what? I just showed up. Like, bro, you've been here four hours, what? And so, no, 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 guys, like, guys, guys, like, listen, listen, guys are pretty good about not holding grudges. Like, as a dude, like, you could run over your boy's dog, like, in his driveway. Like, you come pulling up, and you're like, gunk, gunk. And he comes running out, he's like, fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. And you get out of the car, and you're like, he's, he's kind of flatty now. If you're laughing at that, you, you need the Lord. And so, so, so he's like, uh, how long you had? Oh, 17 years you had. Oh, that's a rough way to go out. Hey, listen, um, you want to get some pizza? Yeah, let's get some pizza. We'll come back and, we'll come back and spatula him up later. And so get your heart right. And so like, like, like between dudes, like, like any time between dudes, if you can introduce food, like it's a legal and binding contract. Like we're good. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're straight. We're set. Hey, hey, you know who's the all-time heavyweight champion and not holding grudges? That's Jesus. Jesus, the all-time heavyweight champion and not holding grudges. We can have some fun with some tendencies or whatever the case may be, but we're here today in Winter Park and Winter Springs and Sanford and Oviedo. We're here today worshiping online. We're here today to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we've done that. And we've got an incredible team that leads us every single week. What a privilege it is. We're here to worship God in spirit and in truth, but like, like real deal holy field. Like if Jesus walks in, like real, like, like we're here to worship him in spirit and truth, but like if Jesus walks in and walks up on the platform, all-time heavyweight champion and not holding grudges, and first, like, like, first of all, I'd be like, and once we get past that, right, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like Jesus is standing right here. Hypoth not, 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 like, push aside the hypothetical, like, real deal. All-time heavyweight champion and not holding grudges. I say, hey, Jesus. Um, hey, Jesus, you remember when I was 15 and I started entertaining myself at the expense of girls? He would say, no, John, I don't remember that. I say, hey, Jesus, you remember when I was 17 and I cussed my mom out so bad, disrespected my mom so bad, cussed her out so bad, she kicked me out of the house. Jesus, do you remember that? Not hypothetical, like this is, this, like, this is my story, right? This is my, this is my life. He said, no, John, I don't remember that. I say, hey, Jesus, you remember when I was 17 and I cussed my mom out so bad, she kicked me out of the house. I had to go somewhere. Uh, but I grew up in a home. My parents were divorced before I was two. I have no concept of what it's like to have a mom and dad at the same place at the same time. And, and Jesus, your word says if you look at someone with hatred in your heart, it's as if you're killing them in your heart. Jesus, do you remember that I used to kill my dad in my heart because I couldn't for the life of me figure out why I was not good enough for him to love me? He said, no, John, I don't remember that. I said, Jesus, remember that time I cheated on the math test at school? He said, no, John, I don't remember that. I say, Jesus, do you remember the other, the other 11 times that I cheated on math tests at school? Because I was not good at math, Jesus. Like, you knew, like, if I, was, I had all this other stuff and math, like, I would have taken over the world. And so thank you for helping me with that humility. And so, but, you know, math in school or, or expense reports or taxes, like, like, like we just kind of, it just kind of moves along. Some guy's like, well, that hit a little close to home. And so he said, no, John, no, 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 no. I say, hey, Jesus, do you remember that time? January 23rd, 1994, as a then 22-year-old college dropout that had no 
no concept of a plan and purpose for my life, but uh, I had a clear understanding of my baggage, my past, my hurt, my regret, my guilt, my sin. Jesus, do you remember January 23rd, 1994, in a church service just like this, the day that I asked you to forgive me and to give me new life, to, to forgive me and to restore me, to give me a hope and a future. Jesus, do you remember the day that I, I stepped out of death and into life when I asked you to forgive me? And you know what Jesus would say? Yes, John, that's the good stuff. Here's what I want you to understand in all of our locations, uh, worshiping with us online. I want you to understand there, there is an enemy who is real. And he wakes up every single day to still kill, and destroy. And he, and he wants, he's gonna have a flame broiled pop tart and then he's coming after you. Like he's coming after you. And he's gonna continually like, like play at over and over and over the missed moments, the fails, the, the failures, the, the regrets, the guilt. He's gonna just play that over and over and over because the final statement, and here's what you need to understand, the final statement that we looked at just a minute ago and we were having fun with love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not, love keeps no record of wrongs. Well, the final statement there is, is love never fails. And here's the thing. It's not supposed to be your name in there. It's not John never fails. John certainly fails. Rebecca absolutely fails. Anthony fails. Like, like, it's not supposed to be your name. It's supposed to be Jesus' name on your behalf. And Jesus on your behalf never fails. Have you been a beneficiary of grace? Have you received that hope? It changes everything. It changes everything. It changes everything. My life verse is, is Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. I've got a lot that I have asked God to forgive me of. And he said, okay, I'm up to the task. I'll set you free from that. No, no, that no longer defines you. And it doesn't embarrass me in the least to stand on this platform and share some of the, some of the worst elements of my life because that no longer defines my life. Have you been set free? Have you received grace? Do you understand that? I just, I just want to pause right here, and then, and then we'll finish together in just a second. I'm just, the, the verses, uh, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, that's, that's our foundational verses for momentum this week. You guys hyped about momentum? You guys excited about momentum? Awesome. So our middle schoolers and high schoolers this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we've got momentum right now. We've got about 300 students that are signed up, which is, which is uh, like 125 more than we've ever had. And yet, I'm going to say to you this, church, Winter Park, Winter Springs, Oviedo, Sanford. I, I, man, I feel like there's, there's another 100 students that are supposed to be a part of this thing. Because listen, let me talk to you in, in the room, uh, worshiping with us online. Let me talk to you not as a pastor that you may or may not personally know. Let me talk to you just as a dad. Let me talk to you as a dad who, uh, who happens to have five kids. My wife and I are big believers in creating humans. Like we're just like, hey, let's go change the world like, like one, one created person at a time. Like we'll do our part, right? And so... So, so four of our five kids, we've got a senior, a sophomore, an eighth grader, and a sixth grader. Four of our five kids are a part of the group that will participate in Momentum this week. And here's what I want you to understand. The reason why I say that, parents, the reason why I say that is this. My kids, they play basketball. They play volleyball. They run track. They play football. They play baseball, golf, tennis. They, they, they take hip hop and jazz and, and lyrical and, and, and tap. They, they do all of those things and all of those things are great, but all of those things actually have nothing to do with where God is taking them for the next 70 years of their lives. And so let me just encourage you this week, parents, if your kids aren't already signed up, students, if you're not already signed up, make the main thing the main thing this week. Listen, 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 I want my kids to earn scholarships and, and, and all that's great, but I'm talking about God might do something in and through their lives this week that's gonna affect their grandchildren. Parents, don't miss it. Students, don't miss it. You can go at all of our locations. You can go and get registered in, in the lobby of each location that we have here today. And if you're a student or if you're a parent sitting there thinking, man, I mean, that's great, Pastor John, that's great. I'd love for my kids to go, but we don't have the finances to do that. God's already counted the cost. Don't let that keep you. Don't, let, don't that, let that keep you from participating. God will provide. You just go out there and communicate the desire. God will provide the finances. I'm, I'm telling you, as a church, we've got people that love God and love you even though they've not even met you. They wanna invest in your, in your student. Don't miss the opportunity to get registered today to participate this week in Momentum. Maybe even you could serve at Momentum. Don't miss the opportunity to be a part of that. I want to finish with this. I want to finish with this. I'm talking about loving God and loving our neighbors. And, 
And I want to tell you the challenge with loving our neighbors, just thinking about students. I was thinking about students, and, and, and this applies like anywhere that you're surrounded by people. But I was thinking back to my, to my teenage years, middle school and high school, seven years, one of the most popular kids at my school, you know, multi-sport athlete, all conference, all region, whatever, this and like all these extracurriculars, whatever, whatever people value as a teenager, I was doing those things. And yet, over the course of seven years, and you can think about this. You can think about this and the people that live in your neighborhood. You can think about this with the people that you work with on a daily basis. But over the course of the seven years, no, not one kid ever said, hey, John, can I tell you about my Jesus? Not one kid ever said, hey, John, you want to go to church with me? Not one kid ever. And I want let me tell you, church, as students, as grandparents, and all parts in between, let, let, me, let, me, let me just ask you, who have you written off that God has not written off? See, because I would walk down the hallway. I'm sure, I'm sure that the school that I went to in North Carolina, 750, 800 students, I'm sure there were some Christians there, and yet they heard me walking down the hall talking about F this and GD that, and they wrote me off. And I'm so thankful that God did not write me off. And listen, here's the deal, guys and ladies. As, a, as, a, as an 11-year-old, as a 49-year-old, or a great-grandparent, listen, you never know not what, but who waits on the other side of your obedience. Like, who does God want to set free in and through your, your willingness to put it out there and trust God? Like, who does God want to impact in and through your life? I'm finished with this. A few years ago, I read this book called Searching for God Knows What. It's written by a guy named Donald Miller, also wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz, good stuff. And in, the, in this particular book, Searching for God Knows What, he said, uh, what if an alien came to our planet, which uh, right after the service, we're all gonna, we're all gonna rush uh, Area 51. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> so let's go, <laughs> let's go. Some guys like, wait, why did people get excited about that? Just uh, Google it. And so that's yeah, a thing. And so, so this, this, this guy, Donald Miller, searching for God knows what, he said, if an alien came to our planet and lived with, with us for a year and observed and could only report one thing about humanity, this is what he would say. We're the most judgmental and comparison beings that exist. Like every environment that you walk into, you walk into this room and you're sizing people up. You walk, into the, you walk into the middle school cafeteria, you're sizing people up. You walk into the break room at work, you're sizing people up. You walk walking down the mall, you're sizing people. Like everywhere we go, we're, we're constantly judging and comparison and evaluating other people. Like everywhere that we go. Like all people, it's so, yeah, it is so true. Like we're con like everybody's judging everybody. Like we got the people that vote and believe like this judging the people that vote and believe like this. We, 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 got, we, got, we got the people that uh, got a lot of cash judging the people that don't have any cash. We got the people that don't have any cash judging the people that got a lot of cash. We got the smart people that are judging the dumb people. We got the dumb people that... <laughs> what, what are we doing again? Like, 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 like. I just, that's too, like, some guys like, that's, well, this is kind of funny. And so, no, no, like, everywhere you go, like, you're walking down the mall and you're sizing people up. What are they wearing? What are they listening to? What are you about? Like, everywhere we go, we're constantly evaluating and judging. And, and listen, here's the thing. Maybe you're more spiritual than I. And that's cool, man. If you are, awesome. Like, do your thing. But, but as a guy who's been in pastoral ministry for two decades, I'm not qualified to judge anybody. But I'm commanded to love Everybody. And when Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing? He said, man, if you want to change the world, if you want to be good at this Christianity thing, love God with everything you've got, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I'm telling you, if we're willing to live that out, there's not enough room, there's not enough seats in our locations. That's exactly right. Because people are desperate. People are desperate for the sense that I have value. That God, like God's grace is, like he does love me, like he would be willing to love me. Don't miss it. Let me ask you, like, 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 here's what I want you to understand as we close. Here's what I want you to understand. I, I'm not saying, man, you can just like go around and do, like, 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 here's the thing. As a person of faith, as a person of faith, like if Pastor Eddie comes to me and says, hey, hey, Pastor John, like, I've got some concerns. I've, I've observed a few things in your life that I'm concerned about. And because of my respect for him and because of our, our belief in the word, if he comes to, to me and communicates that from an accountability standpoint, you know what, you're right. You're exactly right. I'm not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about judging people of faith. I'm talking about us as people of faith holding the lostness of lost people against them. Why do, we hold the, well, like, why do we hold the very sins against lost people that, that we ask Christ to forgive us of in advance of them being the re recipients of grace? Like, let's try love first. It'll change everything. So here's what I want to do. 
I very specifically requested, and it's, it's unusual with what we do culture-wise and worship uh, uh, here at Action Church, but I very specifically requested that we wouldn't have the, the, the keys playing uh, and, until this very moment. In just a second, it'll come out. I, this, is, this is just very matter-of-fact. I want to ask you, and we had some fun with, with, with judges and comparison, but I want to give you this equation, and I believe it'll change everything. I'll give you this equation. If we're willing to apply this equation, it'll change everything, and it is that we need to judge less, and we need to love more. If you want to see God do something immeasurably greater than you could think or imagine, be committed to judging less and loving more in your sphere of influence on a daily basis. And I'm telling you, people will flock to sit with you and understand who God is. But the challenge is, is that we tend to judge. And so I want to ask you this question. At all of our locations, just very simple, very matter of fact, I want to ask you if you're willing to acknowledge that you personally, all of our locations, if you're willing to acknowledge that you personally on a daily basis need to judge less and love more, if you're willing to acknowledge that you personally need to judge less and love more, I want to ask you to stand up at all of our locations right now. If you're willing to acknowledge that you personally need to judge less and love more, man, we fall for it. We all fall for it. Holding the things against us, the very things that we ask Christ that we hope Christ would forgive us of are the things that we hold against others. As we're standing, and I would imagine the same is true at Winter Springs, at Sanford and Oviedo. Everyone's standing. I'll, I'll pray over us as a group here in just a second, but I would ask you this question as I close. January 23rd, 1994 is the day that I stepped out of death and into life. January 23rd, 1994 is the day that Christ forgave me of the list of things that I shared with you and a thousand other things. January 23rd, 1994 is the day that I asked Christ to forgive me of my past, my regret, my guilt, my sin. And I think there's probably people in this room and at Winter Park, Winter Springs, uh, Oviedo and Sanford, I think there's probably people that would say, you know what, July 21st, 2019 is the day for me. I want you to bow your heads. Before I pray for everyone as it relates to judging less and loving more, I'll ask if there's anyone in this room, if there's anyone at our respective auditoriums across action, if you're willing to acknowledge that today is the day, I've never received Christ, I've never received grace, and today is the day that I need to ask God to forgive me of my past and my regret, my guilt, my sin, my shame. Would you guys heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me just ask you, if that applies to you and today is the day that you need to initiate a relationship with Christ, I want you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now. Awesome, awesome. Entire family, awesome, yes, awesome. See those hands, awesome, 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 awesome. Yep, awesome, awesome. Raising, raising your hands at all locations. If you're one of those guys or ladies of all of our locations that have raised your hand, just right there where you are, just right there where you are in the, in the sincerity and transparency of this moment, just right there where you are, pray this with me. God, I need you. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my past, my guilt, my regret, my shame. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Heal me, restore me, Give me a new heart, a new hope. And Jesus, as best I know how, from this day forward, I'm gonna live for your glory and not my own. And God, thank you. Thank you for speaking to all of us today as it relates to this, this tendency that we have to look down our noses at the faults and failures of others, the very thing that you've asked us, that we've asked you to forgive us of. And so, so God, as we're standing in transparency across all of our locations, God, help us in our daily spheres of influence to see with your heart and not with tainted eyes. We pray these things in the name of the life changer, Jesus. Amen.